Um, so thanks for coming today. As you probably figured out, I'm Ellen Chiza, and this is Nikki Lee. We're going to tell you a little bit more about the Awesome Foundation. If you're not familiar with the Awesome Foundation, we're a, an unofficial organization, in other words, not a registered 501c3, to give away $1,000 to a cool project every month. It's kind of like guerrilla philanthropy. And if you're familiar with the world of philanthropy at all, you're probably thinking, monthly is a lot. Most philanthropic organizations grant once a year, maybe twice a year, or super aggressive ones grant quarterly. So we want to walk you through a little bit more of how we manage to do this every single month. So every month we get 10 people together and we call them trustees. Our applications are due on the first of the month and after that each trustee goes through and reads all of the applications. They mark all of the ones they like as awesome, appropriately, um, and then we're able to generate a list of the most awesome applications for that month. Then on the second Tuesday of the month we get all the trustees together in one place, often somebody's living room, and we talk about everything on our short list. So we discuss the pros and cons of the applications and what really moved us about them. The fun part is since the applications are a little wacky, we also end up having a lot of very interesting side conversations. Like, what's the proper use of an Oxford comma? And I'm still debating, <laughs> would lemon milk be like the worst, most horrible beverage ever or surprisingly delightful? It's truly a question for the ages. Right, so the nice thing about this is because it's 10 people, uh, we get together and we've always managed to decide on what to award the money to collaboratively. We've never had an issue where it came down to a vote or a struggle. We always do it together. So another thing we should probably mention, that $1,000, it doesn't come from a, a trust fund or an endowment or an official organization or anything like that. It actually comes from the pockets of our trustees, $100 a person. So you're probably thinking at this point, oh, they just picked the numbers to be round. 10 people, $100 each, that's easy. So it's true that that's easy and nice and good for us to organize, but it's also the case that $1,000 is really a sweet spot of how much money to give someone. It's enough money that the person we're giving the money to feels like this thing where they need to do their project now. Someone's giving them $1,000 to do it. They might not just be willing to drop $1,000 on a project themselves every weekend or something like that. At the same time, it's not too much money. So $100 a trustee is not a trivial amount, but it's not so much that if a project goes wrong, you really feel like you're missing out. So it allows us to take bigger risks and fund crazier ideas. It's also not so much that people are going to fight over it. One grantee isn't going to lord it over everybody else who applied or have hard feelings between them. Right. So after we managed to collaboratively figure it out, one trustee, usually one who is super passionate about the idea we picked, is appointed as the storyteller. They're responsible for doing the fun job of calling the person and saying, hey, we're going to give you $1,000. And when they do that, they also decide to set up time when the trustees can get together with the grantee, give them more feedback on their idea, try to help them with any connections we can make, and really just get to know them better. So when we tell people about the Awesome Foundation, there are a couple questions that come up really, really frequently. Wait, wait, wait. Is this a real thing? I thought you guys were standing up there joking. <laughs> Turns out when I tell people about the Awesome Foundation, they don't always take me seriously, unfortunately. So I get a lot of people going, wait, I thought that was just something you strung together and like it was really catchy sounding and that, that doesn't sound like a real thing at all. It's too whimsical. It actually is a very real thing. In the last three years, we now have more than 60 chapters in 11 countries and five continents, which is huge. And collectively, we've funded over 400 projects. So that's more than $400,000 that we've given away just out of our own pockets. And if we continue growing at the same rate we're growing now, by the end of 2013, we'll have given away more than a million dollars to individuals. Which is pretty awesome. <laughs> so the next question we get, other than, okay, fine, is it real or not, is what kind of projects do you fund? Some people are just kind of baffled about what we would do, and others kind of already have an idea in mind that they're like, hmm, maybe I can finally get the money to do my project. So the first thing we look for is things that are actually possible. You might want to apply and write a really catchy application to send your cat to Jupiter, but we don't really believe you could send your cat to Jupiter for $1,000, so that probably wouldn't work out. We also really like things that are new, not incremental. Don't get me wrong, we all appreciate the value of a good thing and keeping it going, but we're really in this space where we want to help people get over that initial hurdle of activation energy to get a project off the ground. Additionally, we like things that are local. Since we have chapters all over the world, you should probably deal with the one that's related. If you want to go build a giant cardboard box fort that looks like a chateau in France, we really like the idea, but the Awesome Foundation in Seattle probably isn't who you want to be talking to. Building on top of that, we're also all about community. You see, we kind of envision this future where everybody's hanging out and talking to each other and laughing and having fun and thinking of awesome stuff to do together. 
So we want to fund projects that move us closer towards that future, not away from it. Plus, we like things that are run by individuals. There's lots of groups out there that will finance someone who's already a 501c3 or already has a huge reputation. There aren't that many people who are kind of like, hey, like you over there in the corner, you look like you could do something cool with $1,000. <laughs> Finally, and most importantly, we like things that are awesome. That can be a little bit hard to quantify, but at the end of the day, if we're reading an application and we think to ourselves, man, this is awesome, then we just go for it. It's more about making awesome things happen and getting some creativity and life into the world than following our guidelines or metrics. We have one other thing we tend to look at, and we refer to it as orphans versus flamethrowers. Not that kind of orphans versus flamethrowers. So the general idea is that we like to strike a balance between projects that are clearly philanthropic and do direct social good, and projects that are fun, whimsical, probably a little bit crazy, and wouldn't get funded by somebody else. So to make that a little bit more concrete for you, uh, we have one chapter in Malden, Australia. It's a tiny town of 1,500 people, and they had someone realize that with $1,000, they could actually give governance training to every single person in the city. That's great. Everyone would be more involved in local politics. They would know what's going on. Hooray. But you don't think about that and think, what? Like, it makes sense. On the other side, we were trying to come up with what to use as a flamethrower's example. And I seriously went to the Awesome Foundation website, and Boston's most me recent grant was for meat-filled pinatas. <laughs> and I was like, what is that? <laughs> it turns out they had a great person apply who was like, good zoos have lions. Awesome zoos have lions and pinatas shaped like zebras that are full of meat, so you can watch lions destroy pinatas. <laughs> OK. <laughs> when we were working on this, Ellen IM'd me, and she said, meat-filled pinatas. And I said, what? <laughs> so in Seattle, we really like things that go all over the spectrum. And a lot of our projects actually incorporate both flamethrowers and orphans aspects. For example, the Seattle Dodgeball League came to us and they said, we want to build a portable dodgeball court. We'll be able to carry it around with us and set it up anywhere and play dodgeball all the time. And so on the one hand, this promotes exercise, which is clearly orphans, right? Exercise is great for you. And on the other hand, it's dodgeball, which is obviously flamethrowers. Plus, they put like, some really cute flamethrowers aspects into their applications. They were like, yeah, if we had this portable dodgeball court, we could put it on a giant raft in Lake Washington, and then you could play floating dodgeball. So I'm still waiting for next summer to play floating dodgeball. Uh, so that gives you one idea of what we funded in Seattle. We've actually funded 16 things so far, and we want to walk you through three of them in more detail and kind of explain what appealed to us about those projects. One of our earliest projects was titled On Of. Two artists came to us, and they said, you know what? Winter in Seattle sucks. It's gray, it's rainy, it's cold. Sometimes it snows two and a half inches and you have to sleep in your office, which is terrible. Everybody is getting like no sunlight at all and we all have seasonal affective disorder and the entire city just mopes around for three months and it's awful. And so what they wanted to do was have an art festival where everybody could come and see tons of installations that were all centered around light. So the idea was on the longest night of the year when winter is at its worst, Seattle lights could go out see a bunch of exhibits that were all about light and get some sunlight and happiness in their lives. So this appealed to us for a few different reasons. First of all, it's very clearly Seattle focused. If they'd applied to Awesome Oahu, I don't think any would have been like, yeah, I really miss the sun. They probably would have been like, okay guys, whatever. Uh, but here, that really stood out. Uh, additionally, it was nice that it's something that affects a ton of different people. So if you think about it, it has three individual organizers who might not have been able to do this without our help. But it also supports the 24 artists who managed to participate in the installation, and then the hundreds of people who ended up going to see it. Even better, it continued. So after we funded it the first year and they held the festival, it happened again this year without any direct support from us. So we were able to give them $1,000 and then let them go, and the project took off. So consider this your invitation to join us at ANA of 2014. It already happened. 2014. Next year. Next year. <laughs> Uh, so, a little bit of a different project. A few months after that, we did safe sex kits for homeless teens. So, a crisis center that was working with homeless teenagers was doing sex education with them, which is, you know, probably a good idea. But they were running into a couple problems. First of all, it was a little bit awkward. It's hard enough being a teenager, let alone a homeless one, without strangers coming to you and saying, let's do sex education, and here's condoms, and here's lube, and like, carry them around, and be safe, and don't be embarrassed, right? <laughs> Not always going to happen. And uh, to top all of that off, these homeless teenagers were, well, homeless. So they had a pretty unstable living situation, which meant that it was difficult for them to pack up all their stuff, relocate to a new place, and unpack without losing things, especially small objects. So we liked this project for a couple reasons. One of the first ones is because the Awesome Foundation is just 10 people sitting in a room, the only people who need to really be supportive of the idea are the people in that room. 
So all of our trustees that month happened to be like, yeah, I really want to support safe sex kits for homeless teenagers. Whereas you could see in another room it might be, well, if we do this, are we encouraging homeless teenagers to have sex? Is this the wrong message? Do we want to worry about that? And as the Awesome Foundation, we don't have to think about those big questions outside of our room of 10 people. Additionally, the person who actually came up with the idea was one of the teenagers that the kids would benefit. And he approached the shelter and wanted to work on it. And we thought, yeah, we really want to support shelters working with their populations and having them help come up with solutions to the problems. So let's change directions a little bit and talk about the experience of going to museums. Think about, for example, going to an art museum. You look at cool things, but you sure as heck don't touch them. You don't make too much noise, and there's a security guard watching you like a hawk to make sure you're not disruptive or breaking anything. You don't talk to your friends, especially not loudly, so you have to discuss everything afterwards or whisper, and you never meet anybody new. The interesting part of this is we never realized any of these things were problems until we read Michelle Del Carlo's Awesome Foundation application. It turns out Michelle had just finished her master's in museology, or the science of museums, and she'd been already working to combat this problem and make museums more of a communal thing. So she'd been running something called the pop-up museum. The idea is that you pick a theme, for example, handmade, and you reserve a space for a couple hours, and you get everybody to come to the museum with an object strictly related to that theme. Then they write out a placard explaining their object, they put it down as an exhibit, and they walk around talking to other people about their objects as well as talking about their own. So it really gets people together and communicating with one another. We know this is true because after the grant, Michelle held a pop-up museum for us and it was a lot of fun. But more importantly, we called her six months later to check in and see how things were going. This is what she had to say. It was just me before the Awesome Foundation, and after the Awesome Foundation, my project moved to a bigger scale. So here's what we mean by that. When we first met Michelle and gave her $1,000, it was mostly her, her friends, some family members, and a couple colleagues that were holding informal pop-up museums in free spaces that they could reserve, like the library. Right, but after the grant, she ended up receiving $200,000 in another grant to create a pop-up museum toolkit. Working with an art museum in Santa Cruz, they're creating a set of tools that any museum across the country can use to hold their own pop-up museum. Oh yeah, and when we got in touch with her, she wasn't in Seattle anymore. That's because she'd moved to Washington, D.C. to work for the Smithsonian Institute's Innovation Lab. And if you're going to D.C. later this year, she's actually going to be holding a pop-up for them too, based off the Civil War, so you should see if it's going on while you're there. Michelle's story is a really great illustration of what's powerful about the Awesome Foundation. Sure, the $1,000 helped her project, but we're not going to pretend that that made all of this happen. Sometimes the more important thing is having somebody read about what you're doing and say, hey, I think what you're doing is really great. In fact, I think it's so great that I'm going to take $100 out of my own pocket and put it towards supporting that. And so are these other nine people. So that gives you an idea of the huge spectrum of things we're willing to fund and the impact it has on the grantees. But there's a set of people we haven't talked to you about yet. The trustees. So, you know, we're an example of that. We do this stuff. So what happened was the Awesome Foundation originally started because there used to be a party called Information Superhighway at the Berkman Center for Law and Society at Harvard. And the party was just about getting people in a room to discuss ideas. And then eventually one of those ideas was the Awesome Foundation. So personally, I really loved going to these parties because every time I went, I met somebody who was really smart, really funny, engaging, and friendly. But more importantly than that, they were really passionate about making the world a better place, whether it was through small steps, like giving a little bit every month, or big leaps, like doing crazy projects. So when an Awesome Foundation chapter was starting up in Seattle, I knew that I had to get involved because I really wanted to stay connected to people like that and have them in my life. I was totally on the reverse side. When I first heard the idea, I thought it was the sleaziest thing I'd ever heard. To me, it sounded like my friends aren't cool enough, so I'm going to give money away to buy some new friends who will like me because I'm helping them do stuff. And I was like, this is creepy, guys. Like, I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, it turns out I was wrong. It's an important thing to be able to admit about yourself. But more than that, uh, peer pressure is really powerful. So when I moved to Seattle, my friends were like, we know you think it's creepy, but you really have to help us. I was like, OK, guys. And I'm really glad that I did, because it pretty much changed the direction of what I was doing. I wouldn't be working at Kickstarter now if it hadn't been for getting involved with the Awesome Foundation. So we're not the only people that get involved. Here are just eight of the 34 people who've been involved in the Awesome Foundation in some form over the last year and a half. And they all come from completely back different backgrounds, too. We have people who work at technology companies, we have a veterinarian, and we have people who coordinate events. And everybody comes to us for different reasons. For example, we have some people who are from traditional philanthropy, and they really wanted to explore different ways of giving back. We have some people who have either just moved to Seattle or been in Seattle for a while and felt like they haven't really connected yet and just want to know what's going on here in Seattle. Others, like me, already knew somebody in the Awesome Foundation and wanted to get more connected with the global awesome community. Another thing is that since the Awesome Foundation doesn't have a specific interest, it's not like going to a meetup like this where you meet other creative professionals or something else targeted at your industry. You're meeting people across the board. 
Besides, it's just plain fun. I mean, where else can you wear pink party hats and dinosaur costumes to celebrate the third birthday of a foundation? And past that, sometimes things happen that the trustees don't even recognize until after. We actually took our sur survey of all the people who've been trustees in Seattle so far, and as a direct result of being involved with the Awesome Foundation, more than half of them have either become more involved in other organizations or started giving more money to charity. That's kind of why we call it the gateway drug to philanthropy. Philanthropy is often this sort of intimidating, scary sounding thing, and we make it fun and approachable. Philanthropy really isn't just for billionaires. So we're hoping at this point you're thinking, I'm sold, how do I get involved? Have I got a shamelessly plugged opportunity for you? So actually in two Thursdays on February 21st, we're having a party at Substantial and you should all come. We're gonna be talking about awesome things and meeting fun people and discussing the things that we've funded over the last year or so. And everybody's going to pitch in five bucks towards a micro grant. Then everyone who's at the party will pitch, will be able to throw out the ideas that they have and whoever wins over the crowd the most gets the money to do their project. So maybe parties aren't your necessarily your thing. We have smaller events too. We frequently do this thing we call awesome hours where we just invite people in, talk about their idea, see if it's a good fit, get some feedback, maybe just meet some people in the Awesome Foundation, kind of get a better feel for it. You can also really help us out by spreading the word. I mean, at the end of the day, we're just a bunch of good-natured, fun-loving people who want to give thousands of dollars away to strangers. So the more strangers you know about us, the easier it is for us to do that. You can also be a guest trustee. If you just kind of thought, hey, that sounds cool, I might like to try that out, we let people come in for one month, kick in $100, come to the meeting, and help make a decision. If you're more the kind of person who jumps in feet first into everything, you can also just sign up as a full-time trustee. That means committing to support projects every month, but it also means that you get to read project applications every month. Plus, the Kool-Aid is delicious. So here's the part where your name tag comes in. If the idea that you wrote down on your name tag for what you do with the $1,000 seems to align with all the things we already told you about today, maybe you should be doing a project. It's super easy to apply. You just have to tell us who you are, what you want to do, and what you would spend the $1,000 on. So hopefully at this point we've convinced you that the Awesome Foundation is a really fantastic organization that you should totally be involved in. But even if we haven't, we like to think that we've shown that you can do a lot with just a little bit of money. Uh, so thanks for coming, and we're happy to answer any questions you have about the Awesome Foundation or philanthropy. Do you want to repeat the question oh. first? <laughs> um, so the question is, why would philanthropy be unapproachable? So, so for example, like, oh. if you work at Microsoft, you know, they have the Give campaign, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they people will donate through that, um, because sort of it's like, well, you know, we're working towards this common goal. But I find that like, I've given a lot of money to friends, like Kickstarter projects and stuff, um, and I just want to see them succeed. But I don't really see that um, from at least the people around me. And I, 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 maybe it's just me projecting, but Okay, so I'm gonna repeat the question so it'll be heard on the video. So the question is generally like, why do people not get involved with philanthropy? Do people wanna give away small amounts of money and why don't they? So I think there's a lot of parts of it and I think a lot of it is about the actual experience of giving money. So like anybody here who's done any experience design knows that that's really key. And a lot of philanthropy now is that you sort of give money and you don't really get anything back, not even an emotional reward, which is why I think things like Kickstarter are taking off because you get to feel this connection to the project and you get to feel like you've actually done something with your money. It's also why like, I suspect Kiva has been so successful because there's a real connection to stories. Um, and I think part of it is that people don't necessarily know what to give their money to and there tends to be like a lot of choice. So like I can sit around with my hundred dollars and be like, oh, I want to contribute my hundred dollars, but then like, where do I pick? Like, there's so many great organizations out there, and I think the Awesome Foundation is good because it kind of narrows that in scope, where you know, like, I'm going to give a hundred dollars every month. There will always be good applications. It's kind of easier for you, less overhead. It breaks the problem down into like bite-sized chunks. Mm -hmm. uh, is there only one chapter uh, in Seattle, or are there multiple chapters in cities? So the question is, is there only one chapter in Seattle, or are there multiple chapters in cities? Most cities only have one chapter, and that's 
partially due to creating a stable sort of system. So we're not like getting 2,000 applications a month. We wouldn't necessarily be able to have enough projects coming in to support like three or four chapters. But larger cities that are better established, for example, Boston and Los Angeles have multiple chapters in their city. It's also not that it has to be like a metropolitan city. Like there are some places that do tiny cities or like Tampa and St. Petersburg, which are right next to each other, both have chapters. Yeah. So the question is, can you reapply if you aren't selected? Yes, we encourage it. In fact, we recently funded a project that um, had come from somebody who'd applied a year before. And so he applied, we sort of said, you know, we really like your project, but we kind of like this other project a little bit more, or maybe it's a little more timely, but he kept at it. And you know, a year later he reapplied and we were just like, yes, we love it. So the question is to build on that, do we provide feedback to people who didn't get selected? So we don't send detailed feedback to every single application, but what we do is we always send, we always let you know if you didn't get the grant. We're not, we don't want to be like a black hole where you submit an application and never hear back from us. Um, and if you reply to that email asking us for feedback, we're more than happy to let you know. We also encourage people to come to Awesome Hours so they can talk to us face to face and get a better idea of what we're looking for. How do you measure your impact? Question is how do you measure your impact? This is actually a really tricky debate within the awesome community. So it's, it's kind of a loaded question um, because there's some people who come, especially from traditional philanthropy, who are really about like metrics and can we quantify everything? And then there are other people who think that our place is actually to be more like sort of crazy venture capital where you just throw money out there and you're totally okay with lots of failures as long as you get a couple big returns. Uh, you can talk yeah. more about what we do in Seattle. So what we do in Seattle is it's been about a year and a half now and after our first year we sent out a survey to every single grantee and to every single trustee to ask them how they liked it or didn't like it. And I think 80% of our trustees were like satisfied or very satisfied with the quality of applications and all of the grantees said they were satisfied or very satisfied with our process. So we kind of get feedback from the community. We also just sort of went through and looked at which projects had like clearly obviously succeeded and we had a significant majority of them that were just doing really well. But we try to be no strings attached and so we hold to that promise. We're not going to come bother you if we give you money and be like, what are you doing? Are you on schedule? <laughs> So the question so the is, question. do yeah. you, we always have to resubmit or do we hold on to projects for month to month? So usually we, we ask everyone to resubmit. The dodgeball project actually was one where we had a month where we had some projects we really liked, but we felt like we didn't have enough information to fund any of them. And we ended up calling up the dodgeball people and being like, we know you didn't resubmit this month, but we really like your idea. If we were to give you the grant, would you accept it? Would you still want to do the project? Now that we're a little further along in the chapter is more mature and we're getting a steadier stream of applications that are well fleshed out. Uh, we don't do that as much. And part of it is because uh, asking somebody to resubmit is not a guarantee. And so we don't want to set somebody up emotionally to think that they're going to get the grant. So we like to be very specific and say, hey, you know, we just want to let you know in particular that your idea was talked about a lot and that it was one of the favorite ideas and that we all think it's really good even though you didn't get the grant. And so if you want to play again, know that and like here are the things that weren't clear, but we're not saying, hey, we're going to promise next month we'll give you money because that's not fair to people. How many applications do you usually uh, receive per month for the Seattle area? So the question is how many applications we receive a month in Seattle. So our biggest month was like 80 something and our smallest month was about 15. We're usually in the 15 to 30 range. Um, and what's really interesting is that the number of applications fluctuates, but the number of applications that we're strongly considering tends to stay pretty stable. So if we have 80 applications, it turns out that a lot of times it's just more of them that aren't necessarily the right fit for what we do. So the question is how long ago it started. Um, probably the easiest way is to go back to our map. 
Right. So the foundation was originally founded in 2009, which was the Boston chapter, and then it kind of spread go. from there. So first it was just Boston, and then I think it was Boston, Providence, and San Francisco, and then I think New York and LA came in pretty early, and it's kind of been growing. And so in Seattle, it started in summer 2011. The animation on the map is actually roughly chronological by year, which is why it took me an hour to make that slide. <laughs> <laughs> It was a total waste of effort, so I'm really glad you asked that question. Now I feel validated. <laughs> yeah. What's the average age of applicants has received was the question. Uh, we don't ask. Also, I've learned from trying to survey people in the Awesome Foundation and get like more data about it that people really don't like when you ask their age. On the other side, like our trustee group, I think, ranged from when we started around 22 to probably 74. And I think since a lot of applications do tend to come from communities trustees are involved with, we do kind of get a pretty broad spectrum of ages. So the question is, with all the expanding chapters, is it hard to keep the original model? Um, and do people want to sort of grow it more and change it? That definitely comes up a lot. So a lot of times we'll get a new chapter and they'll be like, great, where's your 501c3 paperwork? Where can we get it? Where are all like our official disclaimers and liability things? Um, and that tends to go against what the model of what the Awesome Foundation is, which is supposed to be super lightweight. So that is something that comes up a lot now. There's some really interesting organizational behavior stuff that comes into play, but we're all connected through a global mailing list, uh, which a lot of conversations like that come up on. So people are able to get the feel of what the rest of the community's opinion is. And just this last year, we had our first summit where we got representatives from almost all the chapters all in a place in Boston for three days together. And that really helped everybody. It was interesting because we all talked about the same things. And we'd sort of independently come up with the same problems and the same conclusions and the same conflicts. What's the worst idea you've come across? So the question is, what's the worst idea we've come across? I don't know if it's fair to the people who apply to us to answer that question. Yeah. Like, I don't, wanna, I don't want somebody in the audience to be like, well, maybe I shouldn't uh, apply because they'll take my idea and make fun of it in front of a bunch of strangers. Right. And a lot of the ideas we like, keep talking about, like flavor milk, I'm actually very intrigued by. So that was a real application. And like, I really like it. And it's like, kind of funny, but it's also kind of awesome. And we get a lot of stuff like that. It's her favorite idea that's it, it really ever is. been submitted. <laughs> she wants to talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, what is the term of an awesome foundation trustee? Am I stuck with this for life? So it's indefinitely long. And in Seattle, we just ask, by the way, I'm asking, I'm answering most of these procedural questions because I'm the current dean of the Seattle chapter and Ellen actually lives in New York, in case you're wondering. I'm not just talking over her. Um, so we, like, you sign up indefinitely and we just ask that if you are stepping down that you help us replace you. So you can do it as long or as little as you want. If you want to be a full-time trustee for two months, we're kind of going to go, why don't you just guest twice? We, we haven't really found it to be a problem particularly often. We tend to have a lot of people who are interested in getting involved. So we've never had a month where we're like, oh, no, we only have seven people. Where will we find $300? Like, that's never happened. That would be the worst month. Yeah. <laughs> um, right across the street is one of the world's largest philanthropic organizations. Um, they give away billions and billions of dollars. Uh, what do you think that they could learn from the Awesome Foundation? So the question is, what do we think that the Gates Foundation could learn from the Awesome Foundation? <laughs> okay. So while we're on this, the Gates Foundation somehow found out about the Awesome Foundation and emailed us about it, not like on an official capacity, but they know about it, and we have no idea how they found out. So if anyone here knows how they found out, we're dying to know. Yeah, somebody told them. But we're friends now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think um, they're already doing a lot of things that are pretty similar. Like they have programs like the Grand Challenge Explorations Program, where they have people who travel around and participate in local communities and try to fund things locally based on what's already working there, which I think is kind of exactly what the Awesome Foundation does to some extent. I think it's also just a difference of attitudes. Like we're tackling fundamentally different problems, right? They're kind of looking at these huge world problems, like can we cure polio? Probably. Hopefully. Um, and then we're looking at things more like, 
you know, how can we take the experience of just being an ordinary person and make it easier and more exciting and more fun to get engaged with your local community and pitch in? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So the question is, this seems a lot more grassroots than the Gates Foundation, and like, why do you think that is? And I think a lot of that is actually that like, we're only giving away $1,000 a month, and like, if I lose $100 one month, and like, maybe again like six months later, no big deal. Whereas I feel like if you're giving away billions and billions of dollars, it's, it's much scarier to take that much risk. Um, yeah. So the question is, how could you use multiple chapters in one city and still make it easy for people to apply and not end up having to apply to 10 different Austin Foundations? One of the nice things is that alongside all the various Austin awesome Foundation chapters, which are all completely unofficial and just sort of affiliated through um, organic person-to-person -person networks, we also have a more official organization known as the Institute on Higher Austin awesome Studies. <laughs> and they're going for 501c3 status. And their whole, the whole point of them existing is to be, first of all, if we ever need a 501c3 for anything, like they want to be that group. And then they also look out for us and they kind of, they describe their job as herding kittens and something about kitten Voltron. I, anyway, you'll have to talk to Christine Shu about that. But um, so they organize all that stuff. And anytime we get like donations of money as, a, as an entity, they take that. So one of the things that they've done is they spent a bunch of money on getting a really nice website put together for us. And that's not just like the pretty front end, but there's also this back end system. So if you apply, you just apply in one place. And then there's a back end that handles which chapter goes to and who can see it. Uh, the question is, is there ever a payoff for the trustees, or are you really just giving away your money? You're really just giving away your money. <laughs> We've actually even discussed, like, if a business applied and we liked their idea enough, we'd probably even give a business some money. Like, just, like, hey, I have money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's bothering me, right? Just get it over there. <laughs> it's kind of about, like, being willing to put your money where your mouth is without necessarily having a reward. Yeah, but there, there's a huge emotional payoff, I think. Like, when we talk about Michelle, it's not like this abstract concept of somebody we gave money to, right? Like we actually formed a human relationship with her and we like her and we're kind of friends with her. We might get like an in-kind reward of sleeping on somebody's couch at some point. So the question is, have we ever connected people with similar ideas? And then also, like, what resources or human power could we provide in addition to just financial backing? You said it better than I, yeah. 
Um, so for human resources, uh, we definitely we had someone apply who we didn't end up giving the grant to who wanted to do a giant stop motion Rubik's Cube animation. And we liked that. And someone in our chapter had a connection at the Rubik's Cube company. And I don't know if he actually ended up doing this, but he was going to try to get them more Rubik's Cubes donated. And then he was also going to volunteer all of us to like go sit there and solve Rubik's Cubes for them. Um, so we're like totally willing to help out however we can for the most part. We also can like mainline people into Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which Ellen should know about. Uh, yeah, so we also have like a curated page on Kickstarter so we can get you publicity there and we can get you through the approval process more quickly than if you just submitted a project by yourself. We also, I mean, we are always keeping an eye out for ad hoc opportunities to help people do projects by connecting them. So it's a thing we're aware of. We're not necessarily about like, you know, we're going to promise volunteer hours because our trustees didn't sign up for that. But we give people the opportunity to get involved and we help spread the word and all of that. I can't think of a time offhand that we directly connected two people who had the same project idea, but we've definitely introduced a lot of people through the Awesome Foundation before. Yeah. I just can't come up with a good example. Yeah. Did you ever see a trustee moving beyond how a dollar they like and for angel investors? So do we ever see people moving beyond the hundred dollar commitment and becoming more like an angel investor or giving more money? You should answer that, Ellen. Yeah, so we, we have one person who comes every month and gives us $120 instead of 100 to try to like further our mission, which is kind of cool. Um, so when I moved away, I'd been the dean. And the dean isn't responsible for financial contribution because they're responsible for doing all the work of coordinating people and doing the outreach and doing a ton of stuff. It takes a lot of time. Um, so when I left, I actually contributed $500 with the idea that it should be used to let people who couldn't afford to give $100 a month come in and do it. So I was kind of like doing it for the Awesome Foundation, not doing it for a project, but. Yeah, I'm also, so I'm currently in graduate school, which is, you know, obviously extremely lucrative. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm starting at Microsoft in August, and I do have intentions of sort of kicking extra money in since I'm the dean and won't be paying monthly, but kicking in at least a little bit of money to help support projects and scholarships and stuff. What? <laughs> And now we're having a Seattle polite off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go. The Seattle chapter around the around across the country and around the world. Are there any children in youth giving circles in terms of? I feel like I've just had a sense it's a lot of adults, which is great, uh, but certainly younger still work now as well as old school. You might want to, you know, if you want to be, yeah, you're a child or youth, you might want to do a bit of stuff. Don't let something happen. Is there any action for the children in youth? So, so the question, question is, uh, is there any action with children and youth and like youth giving circles? Yeah. I think there probably is around the world. Within the Awesome Foundation, I don't think we've specifically had a youth giving circle. We did have San Francisco specifically said February they were only going to give a grant to someone under 18. And there also used to be a chapter in Germany that would only do grants for kids. Um, we also. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't really had that happen. Um, it's a lot harder for younger people to get $100, so it would be difficult to get a stable chapter going. But it would definitely be an interesting to do. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in as the dean is getting somebody who's much younger to come join us for a month, and like maybe we would sponsor their $100, or they could kick it in if they wanted to. But getting somebody who wouldn't necessarily have the extra capital to do that still able to get involved while they're really young. So the question is, with chapters all over the world, is it the same amount of money anywhere, everywhere, and how do you account for that? And then how is money used differently in different parts of the world? Uh, definitely a big debate about the money thing. I think uh, because, for example, we had a chapter start in Mongolia, and $1,000 there is like most of a year's income for somebody. 
This so, was actually my favorite email we've ever received with a global list. Someone emailed us being like, hey, I really, really want to start a chapter, but I feel like it violates your principles to give out $1,000 because then I'm providing like a year for someone to live, so I'd rather give out the equivalent of $1,000, but if you say that's not okay, you don't want me to be involved, no big deal. And it was like super polite. <laughs> and we were just like, we're not going to yell at you. It's okay. We love you. Can we hug you? Do you feel okay? Yeah. Um, so people do kind of try to make it so it's about a similar amount of money. So like Britain does do a thousand pounds usually, um, which is more money. It's like almost two thousand dollars at this point, but like it's supposed to be the equivalent-ish. Yeah. So people usually they still go for the round number thing because it's a lot easier to publicize. You know, right? Like everybody remembers the hundred dollar laptop. Way fewer people remember the seventy five dollar laptop. Um, and then in terms of like how people use the money, I think that does vary. Like I think the Mongolia chapter tends to have a lot more like things on the, the orphan side of the spectrum just because there's so much more need there and there are less organizations who are actually able to target it. Um, so I think it's definitely based on like the actual community. And Boston maxes out flamethrowers consistently. <laughs> like you really, you should go to the page and just read through the projects they funded. They're insane and hilarious. So the question is, for the Seattle chapter, how do the most of the people who apply to us find out? So we actually added a question to the application that's optional about that because we didn't know. Um, frequently, it's like because of publicity, either from a project. Like, so we got more applications. We had a project that painted a mural on the side of the Capitol Club in Capitol Hill. I don't know if people have seen it, but that got some publicity. And then after that, I think we had more applications for a while. There was a feature in City Arts, and after that, we had more applications for a while. So it's kind of either word of mouth or standard publicity. Lots of internet-y things. People will be like, oh, Twitter. Yeah. I heard about you on Twitter. It's like, wh which Twitter account? <laughs> Twitter's a big place. Facebook is also a good one. Yeah, Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, lots of, lots of people who told other people. What are your goals for the Awesome Foundation? question is, what are our goals for the Awesome Foundation? I mean, I think really, like, at the super high level, we just want to make cool things happen and make more people realize that you can actually just either do a project when you don't have the finances to do it, or you can help other people do neat things. And that like it's a very personal involvement thing. So do we envision, for example, chapters in every state or like every country? And what do we want it to become? I think right now we're still in this phase where we looked around and went, oh my gosh, there are all these people here doing this. And so we're kind of recovering from that initial shock. And right now everything grows really, really organically. So like a chapter will start because somebody moved to a new place. Or in a couple cases, like somebody heard about it on NPR while they were driving, they're like, I have to do this. So we haven't, you know, we're still trying to work out like where did all these chapters come from? How did this happen? Um, and there's also like no one who has like the ability to be like this is where we're going because it's a distributed thing like no one person can stand up and be like this is what the awesome foundation is. Yeah, it's more like being like a I don't know like a coral multicellular collection than being like an animal that has a direction. So is that a task for the higher Institute on Higher Awesome Studies? Which is IHAS, if you think about it. It's pretty funny. Um, I don't think so. Like, I think that would be like, IHAS tends to think of itself as more of a support function rather than a directional function. Yeah. So the question is, how do we discern whether or not somebody actually needs the $1,000 to do their project? That's okay. We don't like go run background checks on anyone. We just kind of like if the idea is awesome and we think the idea is worth a thousand dollars, we'll we'll give you the thousand dollars. It's not like that. We do ask you to submit like a rough how will you spend the money, which is more to make sure you've actually thought through your project than to make sure that like you're like I'm gonna spend twelve dollars on clipboards and like four dollars on this. Like we don't care that much. Yeah, if Bill Gates applied and he had a really awesome idea and he was like, if you give me a thousand dollars, I'll do this. I mean, I'd give him a thousand dollars. It's about the, the you know what what gets done with it, not whether or not the person has extra cash. That is actually something that came up like in our trustee results is we had one trustee who was concerned that um, 
we ended up helping more people who didn't necessarily need the help, and it wasn't necessarily the most like wasn't necessarily the best way to use money if you were trying to save the world. Um, and I think it's more of an experiment in a lot of ways to see like what happens when you do this and do more good things happen because of it. Right, like what happens when we fundamentally disrupt how philanthropy works and do it bottom up instead of top down. So how do we know we're not getting swindled? Yeah. Uh, well, that's like part of the role. We mentioned that we have the storyteller who tells them when they get the grant. The storyteller also tends to like stay in touch with them. And most of the time we find that when people like find out you want to give them $1,000 for your, their project, they actually really want to do it and they stay in touch and they talk to us. Um, and you can kind of just tell when you hear someone's idea. Like I'm sure someone could swindle us if they really wanted to, but so far it seems like people are pretty good on the whole. Yeah, and a lot of people who apply to us don't know that it comes from like us. So we'll meet up with somebody and we'll be like, hey, congratulations, here's your $1,000. And they're like, where does the $1,000 come from? And we're like, whoa, from our pockets. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I have to really do this now. <laughs> yeah. It's like accidental emotional blackmail. So the question is, how do we select the trustees? They come to us. So right now, because um, so not every chapter does this. Some chapters actually have like we have ten people. It's the same ten people all the time. They're always there. There's a wait list and all of that. Um, I don't know as much about their process, but here in Seattle, we usually run with about eight or nine full-time trustees, and then we have guest trustees who rotate in and out every month. And so that's pretty easy to do because then it's just like a matter of scheduling with people. And if we have an extra person or two, we just put that money towards things like having parties. Also, you should come to our party. <laughs> I'm inviting you to a party. Okay. Yeah. So from an experience design perspective, like, um, it seems like you've got a template that anybody in this room, we can, we can envision ourselves in this process, right? And we see the same thing with like Ignite Seattle. a startup weekend, right? It's like you can quickly convey what a startup weekend is, and people can say, oh, I could fit into that, and I could take just this small next step of risk or try something out that I haven't done before. From, an, uh, from a design perspective, I mean, uh, if you guys like, are, like, what are your thoughts on kind of like these sort of new models of simple collaboration we're seeing pop up, and are there any other models that sort of fit this that you have so the question is, um, this is cool because it's a model that you can easily envision, envision yourself in, and that's what enables it to spread. So from a design perspective, what other things are like that, and how do we think it's changing things? This is Creative Mornings question. is kind of like that. <laughs> I mean, like, there's so many parallels. Um, so there's obviously there's a lot of things that are like that. And I mean, I, don't, I can't speak as much to existing things that you guys wouldn't know about. But I know personally, I've been really inspired by that. So now when I do projects, like I'm like, oh, can I make a simple replicable model that does some good that's really easy to spread around? And I think it's, a, it's like a really smart way to do things if you want lots of people involved. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I also don't think, like, we didn't actually think of it. Like, at the beginning, no one was like, man, there are going to be a ton of these, and it's going to go all over, and it's going to disrupt philanthropy. Like, literally, it was 10 people being like, hey, like, what if we each gave $100 to a thing? Like, what do you think would happen? Like, there was no, like, master plan for this. And I think that's the cool thing about a lot of those organizations is they don't seem to start with a master plan. It seems to be someone being like, hey, I really want to do this. And then other people seem to realize that it's extensible.
So the question is, I think, uh, do we get protective of our model? Yes. <laughs> so I don't think we get protective of our model because if you actually think about it, our model is basically just a giving circle with like some really cool branding. Um, <laughs> So like it's been going on for a long time and like we'll share articles of other people are doing similar things and we like that a lot. We worry a little bit more about the name and if other people start branding themselves as like the awesome thing and that's just because we don't want people to get confused. Yeah, it's all about communication. But we yeah. really we really do like we get excited if somebody else is doing a similar thing. Like for example, there's somebody in uh, the UK who's doing a project called We Are Lucky and they just like come up with a bunch of money and they're giving it away to people and then like writing down those people's stories and publishing them. And instead of getting defensive about that, everybody was like, this is so amazing. I want to high five that person. Yeah. And I think especially because um, the number of people who apply to things like that tend to grow with the more people who are involved. So if you got 10 new random people who had nothing to do with our chapter, like chances are you would find even more cool applications and it would do more good, not compete. So the question is, because we have so many chapters all over the world, have we ever coordinated and done something that's like more scalable and directed impact? We had a summit, like Nikki mentioned, and it was the AWE awesome Summit. Uh, and the summit was just meant to um, like get people together and like try to come up with solutions to our problems. Um, so things like that involved the idea of like having a weekly dean chat where deans would like Skype with each other and like help each other. But it's much more of like internal infrastructure than it is about like say like picking a theme like Creative Mornings does. There's been conversations. They haven't gone anywhere yet, but for example, somebody proposed like, oh, uh, Hurricane Sandy sucked. What if we all supported something? And uh, part of the conversation there was about the response time and like how we could actually be helpful. Um, so that didn't go anywhere, but I think it's a conversation that's going to come up in the community again. So probably in a year or two from now, there will be a much more concrete answer to that. Like either we do this or we don't do it. Yes. Yeah. Is the pinata is it cooked meat or raw? <laughs> raw meat, raw. The, the question was in the pinata, are the pinatas cooked meat or raw meat for the lions? I really want to go to this zoo now. It might be my new favorite thing after flavor milk. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, we have so if also, if you're interested, we put out a little bit of swag. So there's some stickers and business cards. If you want to keep touch or track us down or just have a sticker, we put some out by where the name tags are. Yeah, more questions, ideas for projects, stickers. If you have Kickstarter questions, I'll answer those if you want. Thanks for coming. Thank you.